sure all that. I think I'll tell you how. It's been 14 and a half years ago. I was diagnosed with an incurable disease. They finally labeled it an airborne virus of unknown origin. Now, don't that help you out? It's what you call practicing medicine. It's what you call when you don't know what in the world's going on, you just make up a name. They finally did make up a name about that long. I couldn't pronounce it. Making sense to me it didn't matter. I was very ill. First 30 days in the hospital, I code blue 27 times. We're talking seriously, y'all. I'm not talking a headache. I'm not talking a case of flu. I'm talking life and death struggle every day of my life. And it hit me out of nowhere when I thought I was doing everything I was supposed to do. Sometimes bad things just happen to good people. I was struggling, struggling every day just to try to maintain any kind of focus. And every time I would start dying, at first what started happening in the first few months is the virus started invading my, my trachea, my lungs, and it would just shut everything down where I couldn't breathe any longer. So they would rush in with the shots and rush in with paddles, rush in with tubes, whatever they had to, to try to resuscitate me and to get me back breathing again. Eventually, the virus started moving through my whole system. And one by one, it started shutting all my organs down. They had no cure for it. They didn't even know where it came from. Finally, there was a disease control center in Memphis, which wasn't far from us, and a research hospital there. And the head of the research hospital told my doctor one day, he said, you know, it's a strange thing, but we've had 13 other cases reported just like hers across this area in the last little bit. And he said, here's what I need you to do. You need to go meet with that girl. Tell her she's not going to make it. She needs to get her affairs in order. He said, they've all died except one young boy, and he's waiting on a heart transplant, and he probably won't make it. That's not what you want to hear. No, Doctor came in late one night, I'll never forget it. I'd been in the hospital weeks then. He came in and he sat down on the edge of my bed one night. He was a friend of mine. His wife and I were friends. We had even done a Bible study together and they were good people. His father was a minister. And he said, Terry, I've come in here to talk to you tonight as your friend, not your doctor. He sat on the edge of the bed and took me by the hand. He said, I've got to tell you whatever doctor I've consulted has told me. And this was a very good doctor. He trained at Bethesda Naval and a tr tremendous doctor himself. But he said, it was beyond me and I've consulted everywhere I can reach. And he said, everybody I talk to tells me that your end is pretty quick. This thing is going to spread through your body. He told me what was going to happen. And he said, your body just eventually will not be able to function any longer. It can't take all the damage. And he said, you will die. And he said, I'm coming as your friend to tell you, get your affairs in order. Start prepping your family. There's no way out. I looked at him. I said, Dr. Hall, me and you both know God. As long as he's alive, there's a way out. He said, Terry, I know that's what you're saying, and I, I know the Bible. My dad was a preacher, but he said, girl, I'm looking at your charts. Ain't no way out of this one. He walked out that night about 1130. I reached over on my nightstand and picked up. My only sure thing when everything else is walked out. I picked up that Bible and I laid it on my chest. I said, God, I don't know where you are. I sure don't understand the circumstances I'm in. But there's one thing I know. 
the Word of God has never failed. I picked up the phone. I called Steve about midnight by then. He had gone home to rest for a while. It had been weeks. I called him and I said, Baby, when you come over in the morning, I want you to bring me a stack of paper and some magic markers. All right. Give <laughs> Mama her dying wish here. I don't know what in the world she's fixing to do. <laughs> No, he brought them the next morning early. What I did that night is I spent it in the Word. And I said, I may not understand where I'm at. And I may not understand why I'm at. And I may not understand how I even got here. And I sure don't know how to get out. But there's one thing that I do know, and it's the Word of God. And I spent that night, and I looked up every scripture I could find on faith, on healing, on deliverance, on hope, on anything I could find that I thought would be an anchor for me. And when he showed up, I took that magic marker and those pieces of paper, and I started writing scriptures. I said, go down to the nurse's station and get some tape. And I'm going to tell you, we plastered the walls in that hospital room with the word of God. Yeah. 
holy and to lunch. All those stores that he just told you about, I don't know how many quadrillion, I think he's One per second, you'd be 3,000 years just counting the stars in our Milky Way. <sighs> and let me tell you something. You know what that Bible says? He knows them by name. He didn't die for a star. Yeah, 
on that one on them. That's just in the blood. What can I say? <laughs> you know my dad. So, here I am. Been in and out of ICU. Every now and then they would let me go home for a day or two. But they knew I couldn't sustain life long. First three years I was in the hospital more than I was home. They even kept our hospital room. They never moved anybody else in it because they knew if I went home for two or three days, I was coming right back. My body could not function outside of the hospital. <laughs> Doctors finally decided, we're going to try an experimental treatment. Okay. <laughs> experimental treatment. He said, well, I want to talk to you a little bit about it because he said, what the virus has not destroyed, our treatment's almost going to destroy that. But he said, what it'll do, Terry, because obviously you're pretty stubborn about living. <laughs> yeah. Duh. He said, it, it'll sustain your life for a little while, longer than what it normally would be. I said, bring me the papers. I'll sign them. I had to sign off on it because it was going to bring tremendous damage to my body. They put me back in ICU, and what this treatment was, was going to be massive doses of steroids. Because in their medical mind, a virus cannot be controlled by anything, but if we get enough steroids in your system, it will suppress it to give you a little longer time. Now, I'm not talking about prednisone pack or a cortisone shot. I'm talking about hanging IV bags full for three days, non-stop, and pumping steroids into my system. The doctor told me, my internist came in, he said, Terry, we're going to give you more in these three days than I've given my entire patient clientele in a year. Three weeks, I gained 52 pounds, just like that. I mean, just unbelievable. Also, I was hanging from the ceiling. Yeah, I'm not today. Maybe this is a steroid effect. <laughs> Side effects. Makes me hyper. No. So I um, went through this treatment for months. And every time they would try to take me off of the steroids, the virus would come back up. And either I would quit breathing or some other horrible thing would happen. And because all my digestive system finally shut down. Everything shut down on me. So the doctor finally said, there's nothing to do but to leave you on these steroids or you will die. I said, okay. And then it happened. I'll never forget the night. It's 2 o'clock in the morning because I looked at the clock. I woke up in the middle of the night and I woke up from a dead sleep screaming. And that very unlike me. I was hurting so bad. I did not know where the world had gotten hold of me. I literally felt like my legs were going to explode from the inside. And I was in such excruciating pain. They rushed me in to do bone scans to see what was wrong. And what they thought was going to happen had happened. The steroids they had given me way too much. And they had invaded my bone marrow. My bone marrow had started forming fat cells and swelling. And therefore, all my bones just started popping. Steroids had also thinned my bones so much till there wasn't much resistance. And every bone in my body just started cracking and deteriorating. Cannot tell you the pain that came with that. So then they started morphine. As much as you need, whenever you need it, because now your life is really for sure short. He said, don't ever walk again. He said, just walking across the room, something could happen, your, your legs could break. He said, we don't know, it's just, it's too far gone. You're in a wheelchair, and I'm out. I've been to the bottom. The bottom is sound, <laughs> because my God holds it all. Got to the point I couldn't cough, I couldn't laugh. My rib cage hurts so bad. So 
not only am I dealing with episodes of dying all the time and my heart's not functioning and my digestive system, nothing is functioning but now my bones are all deteriorating and I'm in a wheelchair. Then God. He may not come when I want him, but he's going to be there right on time. Even on time, God. I will never forget the day this happened. I had got to go home for two or three days, but I was having to do bone scans every two weeks because of deterioration. And Steve was trying to get me loaded in the car, get me out the door to go back to the hospital to start the treatments. Phone rang. He went back and grabbed it and brought it to me, and it was a name your pastor will be familiar with, T.W. Barnes. Old prophet of God. Gone to meet his reward now, 96. True prophet of God. And he had been praying for me through the sickness. Another whole story in that, but he had been praying for me, but called me that day and he said, Terry, what's happened? Because all this bone stuff that just happened. I was with Brother Barnes and I told him the story about the bone deteriorating. Oh, he said, don't worry about that. <laughs> all right, dude, you ain't in a wheelchair. You ain't hurting like this and you ain't no more pain. That's right. I'm a little concerned down here in Arkansas. Right. He said, don't worry about it. I said, please tell me why. He said, because God was praying for you this morning. God just gave me two visions. And this is in the last book the man wrote on healing. You can get it and read it. God's truth. He said, I saw in a vision you. And he said, I saw through you and I saw your skeletal structure. And he said, what I only way I know how to describe what I saw, Terry, is he said, it looked like road maps on your bones. He said, I had never seen anything like it. He said, it was like they were all cracked. And I said, well, that's exactly what's happened. He said, I petitioned God and said, uh-uh. This can't be. And he said, then I saw the second vision. And he said, in that second vision, I saw the same you. I saw the same skeletal structure. But he said, in that second vision, girl, every bone had come back into place. So go get however many bone scans you want to get. But I'm telling you, by his stripes, you are healed. And can I tell you that? Huge. 
and it was slowly just completely shutting down on me. At first, they started checking it every couple of weeks, and it was every week. They finally just sent me things home that I could check it every day, and I had a log, and I, I would tell them every two weeks how much function it had. And problem was, doctors, they didn't know. They said it's either the virus that's causing it to shut down, or it's just because I was on so many drugs. And he said, whatever the, have, whatever the problem is, your liver is not functioning. It's just barely working. I don't know if you know anything about liver sickness. When your liver don't work, it's a filter for your whole body for toxins. And you are very sick when your liver quits working. And I was so sick every day. And even though I could walk again, and even though I could function on some level, I could not get over that last hurdle. And I really feel somebody pulling me here today. That you've had prayers answered in the past. You've had great things, but there is something. There is a hurdle that you just can't seem to overcome. Oh, I've come to break down that hurdle today and tell you that the devil is defeated. He is a liar. You are delivered. You are healed. And you are set free. Kevin and I even made a point of went to talk to some doctors about doing a liver transplant because I was, I was just so ill. Bottom line, when we walked away from all of that, the doctors had told us. Sorry for too much damage in your body. You're not worth a liver transplant at this point. He thought I was worth it. I don't care what that abuser has said to you about how no good you are. I don't care what that spouse said to you. I don't care what those parents did to you. God thinks you're worth it. Screaming, there was nothing. 
Transplant sitting on the pew in a church. 